Can we thank Tyrone Beverly and his team again for all they've done this week? They have been active. Not only has, um, whoops, sorry, Tyrone been doing our opening, but they've been doing the uh, listening, the relaxation station. They've been doing the, uh, the, the fragrance. They've been doing the yoga. They've been doing the hikes. So they have been all over the place, and I just want to thank them again for that. So good, mor good Friday morning, the few and hearty. So I hope you all have, um, if you haven't, please put your name in the bowl. We will be drawing at the very end for the two $10,000 donations. You do have to still be here at 1145 to receive that. Oh, I realize I don't have my clicker. Here we go. So I wanted to, um, to share a picture of my son. So many of you were so kind yesterday to, to, you know, to say something nice and kind about my story about William. That first little picture up on the right, on the, is that the left or the right? Your left is about the age he was when we first started going to the worry doctor. And then the other three are very recent. And he is, you see him in, in escorting me. I go to a lot of galas and a lot of dinners, and my husband is not having it. <laughs> he says, I'll give you, you get three a year. You can pick the three, but you only get three. My son, however, loves going to these things with me, so he's my escort for a lot of things. So last night when I told him that I'd shared some of his story. <sighs> Mom, you know our agreement is you can only talk about me if it's going to help somebody. Did it help anybody? I said, well, I think it, it made an impact on some people. He said, name one. <laughs> I said, okay, I can tell you about a conversation I had with someone and he was impacted by the fact that he too was adopted. He too had a birth mother that was uh, a drug addict. He too understood the kind of anxiety concern about, you know, whether that, that addictive trait is, you know, part of your, your DNA. And it was just really special to him to kind of hear somebody else talk about it. And he said, Okay then, so I wanted to share that. I also wanted to share some um, feedback that we've been hearing over the last few days, last couple of days. One, quite a few of you have mentioned to either me or one of our staff that you've noticed some uh, negative or critical commentary on social media about the, about the symposium uh, and about the foundation or about some of our speakers or, or me. Yes, we know. We're aware we were in contact with um, that organization over the last couple of weeks. We were expecting it. We happen to not agree with their interpretation of our behavioral health agenda. They have every right to, to voice their opinion we just happen to agree with a vast majority of their opinion. That being said, whoops, this, I'm going to just plan B. But that being said, that we um, uh, disagree with their interpretation, that doesn't mean that we dismiss their feedback completely out of hand, because there are elements of what they are sharing and saying that we need to pay attention to, that we need to be sensitive to, and that we need to be aware of. So it, it's, it's not, I don't want to say that their, their commentary is in, in not in vain, but 
there are elements that we certainly support and believe and think that the foundation has to pay attention to. So I wanted to talk about that. Now, after yesterday, last night, I wasn't sure if I was full or if I was empty. Yesterday was an, in, it was an intense day and we had a lot, a lot of um, conversation and, and a lot of positive comments from you, but there was a lot of conversation around the panel of uh, young women. One of the comments that we heard was that, that it was exploitive to have them up here. And to, and to that, I actually want to respectfully disagree. All of those young women we learned about because we saw them speaking somewhere else. They, with the exception of Mia, the other three are quite accomplished and quite experienced at speaking in front of groups and it's their part of, it's, they consider it both part of their recovery and part of uh, their mission and purpose. So Macy Ray, thank you Jeremy, Macy Ray and her family of course came as a family unit. Macy Ray has her own nonprofit even when I asked one of the questions, she said, well, usually when, I ask, when I'm asked that question, I have like 20 things I, want to, I tell people, but I'm only gonna give you two. So she's quite accomplished. Uh, Cassandra wasn't able to stay after, afterwards because she had another speaking engagement to go to uh, last night. And Amara was the least one phased about the crowd size. She said, I've, been, I've spoken to crowds much larger than this. And Mia got a little taste of it and I think Mia now is kind of make, gonna make this a habit. She's becoming now the, an, want to be an advocate. So those young women uh, wanted to tell their story. Most have told their story before. It's part of their, uh, their purpose and their, their recovery and, and so I, I just respectfully disagree that that was exploitive of them. There was also quite a bit of concern around Amara and whether or not she was re-traumatized uh, on stage yesterday. And as you heard, Amara can speak quite well for herself. So I asked her, I went to her and her grandmother and said, here's what people are worried about. People are worried that you were re-traumatized. You won't be here tomorrow. What is it you would want me to say about that? And Amara first laughed and I said, no, I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna address this tomorrow. What do you want me to say? She said, well, I did, uh, she said it did probably catch me, it caught me off guard that it kind of uh, hit me that hard. She said, but I just take it as a testament to how far I've come and, and it's just still part of my journey and this is part of, this is all part of my recovery. And she said, and even after I kind of broke down, it actually made me calmer. And her grandmother said, first of all, thank you for being concerned about her her grandmother said, you know, to many of the folks in the audience, it was, it was a traumatic story to hear. She said, but that's our life. And so to us, it was just Thursday. And tomorrow, it'll just be Friday. And she said, Amara hasn't cried in years. And so the fact that she did, her grandmother took it as a blessing and a breakthrough. So that's, the, the, that's, that's from them, their reaction to um, some, of your, some of your concerns and worries. And then there was also concern about part of what Mara talked about, uh, suspected abuse of her, of her sister. And so what was our obligation as a foundation? What was your obligation with that knowledge? And when I mentioned that to Mara's grandmother, she said, you know, we have no idea where Amara's mother and sister are. We haven't heard from or talked to them in years. We don't know where they are. Amara, Amara assumes that because she was um, abused, she assumes that her sister is, and she would love to save her from that if that's happening, but we have no idea where they are. And even Amara, as you recall, Amara said, she doesn't really remember how old her sister is because she hasn't seen her in years. So we did follow up with 
with that. We don't know that there's anything we or you can or should do about that, given that even they don't know where they are. Um, and then, and then I don't know how many of you came up and said, you know, we are going to, we are going to pay for Amara and Mia to go to college, aren't we? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, the foundation can't do that. We can't give a gift to an individual like that. And we can't, most colleges don't accept, can't, you know, you can't set up a scholarship for a specific person. However, if anybody wants to set up a GoFundMe page or crowdsource it, I'm sure we can probably, uh, there are plenty of people in this room that would contribute. So that was kind of the, the uh, that's just kind of a recap of the feedback from the last couple of days, particularly yesterday. And I heard lots of people talk about that it was just a heavy day. It was, uh, uh, some of the stories hit close to home or some of them were just, it was just the, the, it was just the sheer weight of them all, one after another. And if you didn't come to the screening last night of the movie es Escape, written, directed, produced, and acted in by the young people of the Ute Mountain Tribe, you missed uh, a treat. And so now mark my words. So we're gonna have Amara who's gonna have, who's gonna write the Netflix series and we've got, we've got these young people at the U Mountain Tribe who are going to have the production company. It is going to happen. <laughs> and it was, an out, it, was just, it was outstanding. So uh, I, I do think if you go to there, to the website of the, of the tribe, that movie and another one that was produced and made by the, uh, by the, by the youth, are, are on there available, so it's well worth, and they're 30, 35 minute uh, movies, so it, not a lot of your time, but well, well worth your time. And then lastly, you know, I always have to give my dance awards for the dance party. <laughs> so the junior award, I don't know if he's in the room, the junior award, the junior dance award goes to DJ McCla McClanahan, I don't think DJ's here, but to DJ, we will give a $250 gift certificate to help with those back to school expenses. And then in the adult division, uh, we've got Dee Dee, and I can't, I don't know what Dee Dee's last name is. Where's Dee Dee? Is Dee Dee here? What's Dee Dee's last name? McPherson? Mc, McPherson. So we will give, we will make a thousand dollar donation to Dee Dee's organization, and then for the mail, there was Adam, I mean Aaron Miltenberger. <laughs> who had some serious moves. Uh, and, and so we will make a thousand dollar donation to the Boys and Girls Club. And then on the staff side, Todd Van Minter and Alexis Waitman. Alexis was unencumbered by her family and kids last night, and so we saw that. So they get an extra day off. Okay, now on to our program. We wanted to just also give you some resources. Uh, certainly this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but people wanted some resources to um, for, who, who they could call or who they could share with their friends and family to call. And then we will put, I think, uh, Taryn, we're going to put some uh, other resources up on our website. So the listening lab this morning, now we've got you here, we're going to let you, um, you be the, you are going to be the program. So we're going to have three rounds. We're going to have a question each round. And so we've got 15 seats up here, actually 14, the 15th one's for me. We're going to have 14 of you volunteer to come up and spend 20 to 25 minutes uh, talking about 
three questions. Here are the three questions, and but we'll only do one at a time. So the three questions are, the first one is, what's the path forward to create an equitable, preventive treatment and recovery system in Colorado? That's, so think about whether you want to comment on that question. We're not re-identifying problems. We're talking about solutions and the way forward. Second question is, what and where are the next generation of cutting edge practices and policies that we should be looking at and working at, whether they're here in Colorado already, whether they're somewhere else, what are, what's, what's out there that we should be paying attention to? And the third question is, so what's the role for the foundation? So the 14 people who want to come and talk about this first question, what's the path forward, come on up. We have a ramp if someone ha has a, a physical disability and can't climb the stairs. So those 14 people who want to tackle, who want to talk about this question, come on down. Come on. If only these if only these folks want to talk, then you'll get more time to talk. If their seat's still open and you want to, then they say something that triggers something for you, you can come on up and come on up and join us. So we've got microphones, probably for this crowd, about one for everybody almost. Grab one over there. Get the other one. All right, so very quickly just tell us your name and the organization you represent, and then whoever wants to start can start. My name is Kristen Bates. I'm the Director of Strategy, Policy, and Communications for the State Office of Behavioral Health under the Department of Human Services. Hi, my, my name is Veronica. I am a, a um, student in the Colorado School of Public Health. Um, I'm going for my MPH, and I also work as a coordinator for Developmental Pathways, which is a nonprofit organization that provides services to individuals with developmental delays. I'm J.K. Costello, and I'm a physician consultant with the Stedman Group. I'm Cindy Rauer. I'm a physical therapist at Platte Valley Medical Center, and I work with people with persistent pain. I'm Kimberly Bahanek, Regional Director for the Center for Mental Health in Gunnison and Hinsdale Counties. I'm Ingrid Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Operations and Policy at the Colorado Center for Nursing Excellence, and I'm a nurse. And we'll just start sharing the mics. I'm kind of falling out of the picture, but my name is Suze Bulay, and I come from the organization that is Americas for the Conservation and the Arts. Hi, I'm Carl, Dr. Carl Massar. I'm the president of Heart Centered Counseling, an organization that's committed to expanding access to behavioral health care in Colorado. Christina Garam, the executive director of West Mountain Regional Health Alliance. And Sharon Raggio, I am CEO of Mind Springs Health and West Springs Psychiatric Hospital. Okay, so we'll start, we'll share some of these mics over here. Who wants, to, who wants to start with the first idea of the path forward? I'll start. One of, one of the things I think is really important with the path forward, and certainly this conference has started to address, is, is the issue of stigma and breaking down stigma. Um, I would suggest that peer workforce has a significant um, uh, opportunity to help address stigma even more and to really create some outreach. I think one of the things that uh, we've seen from our speakers, as well as I know I experience in our organization, is that people with mental health and substance use disorder challenges often are not the first ones knocking on the door saying, I need help. And it really takes some engagement. And I'm a big believer in focusing on engagement 
and engaging people into treatment. Treatment works, but a lot of times people, and we heard this uh, from some of our speakers, people will start treatment and then drop out, and, and we really have to be about meeting people where they are at and engaging them, and sometimes that means not waiting for them to call and come into our office. It means going out to where people are, and I'm a firm believer that a peer workforce is, a, um, is, is one of the avenues to do that. Uh, at MindSprings, I'm proud that about 10% of our workforce are peers, and peers are people with lived experience, people who are in recovery from a, men a mental health challenge or a substance use disorder challenge. And they do things that a professional cannot do, and they are able to reach people in ways that a professional wouldn't even begin to touch. And that's not to say the professional stuff isn't needed also, but again, we're not going to be successful unless we're about engagement. So that would be one of my thoughts with respect to a path forward. And just so people know, we're, are my, the staff are taking, taking notes. Other comments? I think it's really important to have uh, community-based solutions. I went to a pr presentation by Vermont, who has a really good drug treatment system, and it really clicked. I knew everything that they did. I'd read it all online, but one of the guys said, things got better when our community started to take ownership of the problem. And it really clicked for me that that's, sending people to Florida for rehab is not gonna be the solution to substance use or, or mental health problems. And so I think creating things in, in Grand Junction and in Durango and Steamboat and um, Frisco, you know, that, that really takes ownership in the community and doesn't send people out um, so that people can have you know, peers and have their community and their family around and have jobs and be in their housing is really, really important. Um, so I think that's part, particularly for substance use, part of the way forward. We often run up against access because we're a frontier community and sometimes just getting to the clinic beyond the stigma of coming to the clinic um, are huge barriers for us. So in addition to peers, I also believe that from the insurance company's perspective, there needs to be reimbursement for um, mental health and substance use work in the community and that it's not disallowed automatically, that if there is a medical necessity reason that we need to be serving in the community or a different location than our clinic, that we should be allowed to do that and reimbursed to do that. Um, I think a lot of parents had questions yesterday about um, if I don't see the signs, if there aren't warning signs, if my kid won't talk to me, how am I gonna know that they need help? And I think that, um, SBIRT screening brief intervention and referral to treatment, which is an evidence-based program in schools is a really valuable thing. Um, I know our state has worked really hard to get this done, but when we look at screening early and often, um, that's where you're gonna find individuals who maybe don't feel comfortable talking to their parents. Um, there was a lot of youth suicide work that was done last year um, trying to move forward, how do we do more youth suicide prevention and the kids came and testified in front of the legislature and they said, um, you, even kids who have good relationships with their parents may not be able to talk to them, but especially for kids who don't have a strong relationship with their parents or their parents are part of the problem, um, they need to be able to be identified and connected to treatment. So I think that um, using evidence-based programs to screen youth in schools is, is a fairly essential thing and then also making sure that we have peer support and access um, so the referral goes somewhere would be the other very essential piece of that. I always look at healthcare from a workforce lens because I work for the Healthcare Workforce Center. And when I go out into rural and underserved areas in Colorado, what I'm very, very sure of is that if we don't build that workforce from within that community, where they are, it's gonna be really hard to do. And communities really like to invest in themselves and their own people. And when you look at behavioral health, it is, it's a sensitive issue, and it's really hard. So I think we have to look at, at from a workforce standpoint, at trying to build it, build that behavioral health workforce from the communities in which they already live. So we're not trying to relocate folks into areas on loan repayment or whatever, and it's not just physicians and it's not just nurses, it is a much broader healthcare workforce that we have to try to start building from within the communities in which they already live. And to build on that, I also agree, I think 
I come from a physical uh, background, and so I understand I can work better more interprofessionally with behavioral health practitioners, and I feel that would greatly benefit my patients. And also I can do a better job at screening and knowing how to refer, and the mental health first aid could be a, a great pathway to that. I would, sorry, I would just add, um, recently I had a friend who I did not realize was suffering from um, a substance abuse issue, and for various reasons he shared with me what he's going through. And um, I told him, I said, you know, I know where to refer you and where to get you involved, and I think what people have said is very apt, because he said, I'm just, I don't think I'm ready. And I said, well, I'm gonna give you the resources anyway, and I'm gonna keep encouraging you until you are. But I think part of this process is just normalizing that people have mental health issues. They have substance abuse disorder issues and it's not a failing on their own part, it is what it is. And so I would advocate that it would be awesome if when you went to the doctor for your wellness visit, you also had a short mental health wellness visit and had a chance to maybe talk about the stressors and what, what's going on. I just feel like it's not normalized and it's like, oh, there's still that understanding of like, oh, you went to a counselor, you went to, you, you talked to someone. And so we've, we, have to, we have to erase that and create a, a safe space so people can get the support they need. So I just wanted to add the importance of family. And I think we saw that yesterday um, with Nick and his father. And, you know, I, I work for the state, but I'm here representing myself because I have family members um, that have been hugely impacted by this. And as a family, I have not felt empowered to improve their lives, for them to improve their lives. Um, and so that's what I would like to see, is I would like to see families empowered. And in the situations that I'm involved in, they're adult family members, uh, which makes it even more challenging. Um, but things can go off the tracks really fast, and it changes someone's life forever when they do. And so I would like to see families as a part of those discussions um, in the um, wellness, the treatment, um, the identification um, and the planning um, for our family members. Yeah, I, um, I just want to add a couple pieces. Uh, first, I just want to say that I personally, I, I love behavioral health. I love mental health. I have a, uh, when I met my wife about 25 years ago, backpacking through Europe, uh, she, uh, we were being and traveling together and uh, she, as we were talking, she said uh, that she had a therapist. And I said to her, what's wrong with you? And that, that didn't land very well. Uh, we got through that, luckily. Um, but uh, that, that was an introduction to me to the world of therapy. And uh, I really view this as a very rich field. Um, I look at me mental health in terms of what it can do. And um, if I think about it from a very pragmatic standpoint, from the standpoint of cost savings, I see mental health as having the capacity to be a tremendous cost savings across fields. Certainly there's tremendous data showing cost savings with phys with in, phys in physical health, but there's, tremen there's tremendous cost savings in all, a number of other systems. My hope is that over time, as behavioral health moves more to the forefront um, and people aren't saying what's wrong with you and they say they've gone to therapy, uh, that what, what happens is that there's a recognition of how much more funding behavioral health needs. Uh, we have a tremendous access to care issue. And as we work to resolve that access to care issue, as more people step forward to, to create access to care and more people get support, uh, that, then, that lends itself to needing more funding for all that increased access. So my hope going forward is that as we start to recognize how important and valuable behavioral health is, that we are able to increase access to it and increase funding to support that access. I'd like to piggyback on that. My name is Denise Kidd, and I'm a licensed professional counselor, a licensed addictions counselor, substance abuse professional, and an acu detox specialist. 
Um, I'm the Addiction Recovery Services Coordinator for the Public Community Health Center. So that program or that service is designed to um, provide MAT services to pregnant women addicted to heroin. We also treat their partners that they are also um, using. And one of the things that I want to say and is just profound to me is as a licensed professional counselor um, and increasing access to services for um, our senior age population is I cannot um, bill for that service uh, because um, I have to work under the supervision of a um, licensed physician. So um, it's a huge soapbox of mine. There are many, many um, wonderful, excellent counselors out there who are licensed to provide great benefit in accessing um, services to our senior age population. So I would want to encourage everybody here um, to write to your legislators to pass, to ensure that legislation is passed, again, increasing access to services for uh, many of our senior age population. Very important issue. I, I would just echo that and say that there are multiple policy changes. The one you just spoke of is absolutely uh, a top of mind one, but there are multiple policy changes, and I know that's really our next question, so I might just stick around, Karen. Um, but, but really, the substance use disorder funding is separate from mental health funding, is separate from uh, physical health care funding, and we're not treating the whole person when we have separate funding silos with separate reporting requirements and separate um, access uh, qualifications, and, and that's a huge challenge. Um, I would like to piggyback on something that was mentioned earlier. I don't come from a mental health or, or behavioral health background. Um, However, I believe that unless we really see each a patient not as in isolation, but as part of their family structure or lack thereof, we will have keys to the answers in many ways. Because a lot of this, uh, uh, a lot of behavioral health is connected to the disconnection of that we feel nowadays. That's why when we're connected here, whether it's on the stage or with putting our hands on the shoulders or in spirit, because we believe in this and we all kind of rally around it, like you know our cause at the moment, we need this in order to actually uh, rejuvenate ourselves, uh, create energy and so on. Um, I'm, our organization uh, works Really, it's, it's really important to also do the peer workforce, uh, have community, a community base and work with the community, increase the access, uh, create a safe space for everybody and um, uh, create a, actually strengthening the positive assets. And the most important, that is the first step to policy changing. Because once you have everybody involved and engaged and uh, giving them agency to not only make decisions but becoming agents of change within their own community on a smaller level, you don't need to have a degree to actually heal somebody and at the same time heal yourself. Uh, we work a lot with the arts, but we work in a very spiritual way with each other, and uh, unless you commit to do the work yourself that you do with whoever you want to treat, I think it's not going to work. And um, of course, we have to look at the reality of the healthcare system, which is totally screwed. But um, you know. We just have to be hopeful as long as we get more and more people involved to make the shift and create that agency. Uh, hi, I'm Patty Boyd from Tri-County Health Department and I would like to speak to two things and really from a population health um, standpoint and stigma has come up a couple of times. 
we know um, from research that's been done that we're all aware of stigma and we all know it's not good for our work, but yet in our actions and our thoughts and the way we treat each other, we are stigmatizing. So I think for prevention to really start to occur that we, um, um, as we've heard throughout this conference, we've had multiple times to talk about stigma that we come to some kind of agreement and I, someone said once you just have to throw a noodle on the wall and see if it's going to work or stick uh, and move forward with some good language around stigma. The other um, area I think we have opportunity in Colorado particularly is around our conversations with risk and protective factors. Uh, we have multiple grant programs that use different um, language and we go out into our communities and we promote uh, risk and protective factors with a different language um, in each of those communities. If we could come up with some common language that talks about trauma-informed care in ACEs and use it consistently, um, then we would, um, I'm a chemist by training, and that saturated solution experiment you remember from um, grade school when you had to keep putting the drop of food coloring in the glass of water, well, I think we could turn the water green. Uh, but we all kind of own our own language and don't really kind of want to come together on that. Uh, we all have mental health. We all have good mental health days. We all have poor mental health days. So um, getting our feelings and our head attached to our physical body, I think, would um, be helpful. Um, I'm going to give you last word, Veronica. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to build on what was said earlier about engagement and also um, including the community into policy changes. I think that building resilience in the community is important because there's not enough mental health providers to meet the needs of everybody, and there's also not enough representation. So I feel that um, training community members to address the mental health needs of their community is important. There are a lot of organizations doing that via promotores, and I think that that's important to meet the need. Um, and also, I feel like organizations should build more collaborations. I feel that each organization has their own roles, their own policies to to meet, but they're not really collaborating, and some organization might have a resource that other organizations do not, and I think that more sharing of resources could help meet the needs of community members. Go ahead, I'll give it. Yeah, I wanted just to um, say one last thing about integrated care. Um, for example, the public community health care, we're talking about, um, I hear a lot about stigma with the mental health side of things, substance use disorders, issues. If one was to, any of one of you were to come to our clinic, um, you would not know if you were seen for a medical visit, for a mental health visit, it, because of that integrated piece, and that's the beauty of the integration to help get away from that stigma. Thank you all for your comments, and let's, as they, they leave and the next group walks up. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. But these, I see you first. Yes, if there's room. Yeah, let's just see how many people come up. All right, here's the next question. What's the next generation? Aha. You can come on back. Come on. What's out there that we should be paying attention to? And again, if you will, um, 
just quickly go around and tell your name and your organization, and then we'll get the conversation started. My name is Pam Giner. I'm an organizer for Girl Trek, a nationwide walking uh, health organization, 150,000 women strong. We're walking to prevent uh, preventable heart diseases. I'm Erin Miller with the Colorado Children's Campaign. Ida Rhodes with Catholic Charities in Pueblo. Hi, I'm Susan Motika with Boulder County Public Health. I'm Anne Marie Peterson with Alamosa County Public Health. Bill Fulton with the Civic Canopy. Sharon Raggio with Mind Springs and West Springs, and I threatened to come back, and I have, so thank you. Bethany Prey with the Colorado Center on Law and Policy. Beth Rolstad with Homeward Pikes Peak and the chairperson of the Pikes Peak Continuum of Care. And Linda Osterlin, academic dean of Rickard Hartman College for Health Professions at Regis University. Okay, who wants to start? I'll start. One of my biggest concerns is um, sober living homes in the community and their lack of licensure and policies and standards to protect those who are living in sober living. Um, it's kind of a free-based economy right now, and I think that there's some harm that's happening in those sober living homes without any regulations. So, the, so what's, the, just what's the fix? The, the, the but there could be a licensure that anyone who's operating a sober living home could need to be licensed by the state, and I think that, that would provide protections for those who are living inside and um, alleviate concerns of family members who have, who are helping to pay for individuals in sober living when they're not actually moving forward in their recovery. Thank you. Got it. So I'll go next. I'm a, I'm a big advocate of, of two principles that I think will really move things forward. One is I think we need to have a global budget where it is one healthcare budget that encompasses substance use disorder, mental health, physical health, uh, prevention, which often isn't talked about enough and certainly not funded, but I am very much in favor of a global budget as opposed to a fragmented budget. And then secondly, I really believe that we have to uh, get to a level of community integration. We're doing a lot of practice integration, as has been discussed. I think we have to get to a level, and it was talked about a little bit in our last thing, of community integration where community organizations are deep, deeply collaborating and creating a community-based continuum of care to include all of the social determinants of health and that's all of the prevention and all of those things. And then it is funded at the community level, again, in a global budget way. Let communities find their own solutions because that's where it happens, is at the community level. Give communities the funding to do that but hold the accountability that communities create, really, at the community level, a system integration. So I just want to piggyback off that in terms of preparing healthcare educate, or those who provide services and looking at interprofessional education experiences and core competencies for nurses, for counselors, for pharmacists, all having that experience at the university level where they are practicing in collaboration and learning from each other, and then those are the ones in the future going out into those community agencies prepared to have those collaborations and practice together to break down the silos so that we can, we can treat people as a whole person. Yeah, so I'm just kind of thinking as you mentioned that, um, Sharon, even before we get to some of the policy solutions, some of the discussions that I found most inspiring in some of the afternoon sessions were, um, it's unlikely we'll ever have enough resources and enough professionals to solve these challenges that are they're so far upstream. And a couple of the discussions have pointed to, it made me think of that analogy of the canary in the coal mine of, you know, the miners would send canaries in and if the canaries died, that was toxic air. Sometimes I think our policy solutions are trying to equip canaries with gas masks or make them more resilient to toxic environments. Like we're, we're trying to increase our ability to sustain lives that are fundamentally misoriented. And 
what is it that's producing the kinds of conditions that most of us find ourselves in? And one woman in, in one of the sessions, I thought, just had a good, she said there's a fundamental illusion that life in the United States is about individual success and achievement. And that premise alone explains so much, the stigma of why we have a hard time talking about these. I think in the conversations with communities before we figure out the policy solutions and the, and the kind of practical professional to, to, to be able to stop and say, what is it that's driving us into the patterns that we're in? And is it a myth that we want to perpetuate, that life is defined by individual achievement and the success we have? And it seems like that myth, in some ways, is a necessary one to keep in place the inequitable structures that we have. Because if I'm not entitled to what I have because of my hard work, uh, that's a scary thought. Or if I can't blame somebody for their condition because they didn't work, uh, that seems like that edifice is holding up a lot. And so if we were to challenge that and say, if, we're, if someone like me who's in good fortune didn't necessarily always deserve that, someone who is uh, experiencing difficulties didn't create those, we might start a very different conversation about uh, how worthy each of us is in supporting that and kind of changing the pace of the lives that we tend to be living. So in addition to all of those policy solutions, I think some, some element of that fundamental question of what are we doing? Like, what is this game we're in the middle of and is it the one we want to be playing? In Pueblo, we started a little program called uh, SCAN, Support, Connect, and Nurture. And what it is is an intersection between medical and behavioral health. Uh, and what we have is a social worker embedded in a residency clinic. And what we are doing is we are screening folks with ACEs, um, adverse childhood experiences, and also a resiliency tool, and seeing where they are. And these, these are adults, um, but these are also parents of children so that we can put in support systems to help lessen the next generation of ACEs. And it's taking an approach of what, not why are you doing what you're doing, but what has happened to you. And we know that so much of this is linked, not, not always, but so much of it is linked to these experiences in childhood, and nobody has had this conversation with people. And when we first started this experience, what happened was some of the physicians, um, some people were like, oh my gosh, how do we bring up, are we gonna re-traumatize people? You know what? The opposite happened. People wanted to talk about this. They were glad they were asked. And they were glad somebody listened to them and understood and said, okay, let's see, do you, what do you, do you need? Where do we go from here? And I think having that conversation is really, really important. Um, I think this is a great conversation and definitely a lot to think about. Um, I think you're, you're definitely on to something with those early childhood experiences and ACEs and um, I think thinking even, you know, how do we start sort of preventing some of those and I think there are definitely some policy gaps um, in Colorado but I think there's also just like questions here that folks don't have, don't exactly know how to answer. Um, I think one space, and, and Dr. Brooks actually talked about this on the first day a little bit, but um, she, t she talked about the notion that a pregnant woman with substance use disorders uh, is a hot potato that nobody wants to touch, and, and yet they're often in a great place of behavior change. Pregnancy is a time when people stop smoking, stop drinking, make all sorts of life changes. And so thinking about how do we provide um, services for those women, and I think that there's a lot of barriers to that. I think, you know, childcare, like, I've heard stories of women being in group and, like, balancing, like, bouncing their baby on their lap, and it's, like, hard to pay attention to so many things at once. Um, I think, and then thinking about how do we better integrate, and folks have talked about this a lot too, but integrate um, prenatal care and substance use services, um, both so that women who are like an MAT or something can get their prenatal care at the clinic where they can get MAT or near that clinic, and so that um, they, uh, going the other way too, so that uh, OB practices are more comfortable um, treating women who have substance use disorders um, and behavioral health issues in general, maybe they're on antidepressants or other things. 
Um, I think kind of then the next step is working on that dyad between moms and babies and not, I think the conference has had a lot of conversation about sort of family units and parents and their kids, right? I mean, that's been brought up a lot, but those folks all exist in other systems too. Um, so how do we create services that are doing good screening for postpartum depression at a child's well check, for example, which we now pay for through our Medicaid program in Colorado? Um, how do we make sure that um, if a child screens for issues that you know, the mom's able to get services um, also, so thinking about how do we connect early intervention systems, good primary care systems that, that families interact in in those very early years and create um, systems that support both um, parents and, and kids. Um, and then lastly, um, I, getting to some of the social determinants of health that we know are important and that's been brought up a lot and, and I think you know, Bill raised really good points about the systems that we work in and do we need to think about reconstructing entirely new ones. Um, I think that in the meantime, we know that, for example, food insecurity is a, um, a real driver for depression and that it um, is a contributing factor for adolescent depression especially. And so how do we reduce food insecurity in Colorado? How do we make sure that kids are getting the food they need at school, that we have families, um, we have very low rates of enrollment among eligible people into WIC and SNAP in Colorado. And so how do we think about closing those gaps and getting folks enrolled in the services that they're eligible for as, a, as sort of a first step? I'm going to tap back into the ACES. Um, I've been with a group of people in the San Luis Valley, and we spent a year of learning and how adverse childhood experiences not only affect the long-term physical health, but also change the structure of the brain. And we're looking at implementing screening and starting interventions in Head Start with these kids because we have a kindergarten teacher in Alamosa who has stories about these kids coming into kindergarten with terrible behavior problems and when they go back and, and look at the paperwork and their screening tools, these kids have these horrible ACEs and we have to start somehow getting programs into place so that these kids and families can start having some resiliency will help prevent substance abuse later in life and long-term health problems. So I think we need to start addressing these adverse childhood experiences early in life. Um, as an outsider again, um, I think that it's really hard to work just through institutions of um, health centers and schools and things like that because a lot of times uh, that is um, feared by people that are not part of the general society. And if you are um, on a lower income or if you are not included and integrated and sit at the table of the decision making in general, that's how you feel. And I think many of the people here may have not never experienced that. Um, we need to keep that in mind, and I wanted to come really to the point of what and where are the next generation uh, of cutting edge practices. And because our organization, Americas for Conservation and the Arts, um, has youth and family programming that connects uh, public health with environmental health. Basically, we work with uh, com uh, community health uh, workers that then are trained in, with their family in environmental education that then uh, really strengthens the base of their health knowledge and connects them deeper to the earth and at the same time they become stewards of the land because we're connecting them to public lands. They have a place all of a sudden, even though they don't feel that they belong here because, you know, just it happens that life threw them here and they are working three jobs and so on. But we work with families, intergenerational. The positive assets that are already there are built upon. And I think that's, those are all th things that we need to look at because especially struggling 
people and families already have a lot of resiliency and positive things that we are not looked upon and they're pushed aside and, oh, no, we have the solution for you. Here's a pill. No. We need to have that conversation on, in the Socratic process, in the community circle of how do you deal with that? And listen. We need to listen more because just bringing book knowledge is not going to solve the problem. We need to be there with our hearts and create that deeper connection that, that will not just disappear uh, easily. And so I always look at it, the future is to not only restore nature, which is necessary for us to survive, especially here in Colorado, restoring nature and restoring ourselves. Yes. Um, this is a first time for me here at a symposium like this. I'm so thankful for the Colorado Health Foundation. Uh, the fellowship has really enhanced my life. It has enhanced my, my programming, my dedication, my commitment to my community. I'm so glad all these policymakers and people with, you know, organizations and businesses, it's your job to find policy that affects and can be effective within a community. Let me tell you about the community that I live in and my association with my um, organization, Girl Trek. Girl Trek is a nonprofit health organization for women, black women specifically, because 137 black women die every single day due to preventable diseases. We're talking about high blood pressure, diabetes, stress, depression, strokes, anxiety. These are mental health issues that, you know, develop. What we do is we, we take it upon ourselves to free ourselves, women, men, children. We all need to get outside of our environment. Like you said, we're so busy, you know, with the congestion and the, the responsibilities of am I being successful? Am I, you know, making it in life? Well, we're forgetting to live life. We're forgetting to connect with one another. We're forgetting to get outside and to find that time to heal, to listen to our hearts, to reconnect with our dreams, to find ourselves. We're losing ourselves in life without living life. I've been walking for two years. I have walked every block in Colorado. I can tell you the deficits in your community. I can tell you all the great things you have and the amenities you have in your communities. Walking gets you involved in community. It connects to people. I've been walking with seniors, a group of seniors, and nobody's talked about our seniors this week. 88 years and up for two years. Every Wednesday, these seniors come outside their doors excited to number one, be outside with someone who cares about them. Number two, to improve their health, to, to reconnect with community. We take them to picnics, to parties, to activities that's going on in the community. Had them out until 11.30 at night on the 4th of July, really? I mean, they were out partying <laughs> under the stars. They're coming back to life. They have abandoned their canes. They get to the park every Wednesday and they leave their walkers at the, the gate where we come in and they walk in faith to better their health, mental and physical health. I'm saying that until we get this fixed out, something is working and that is connecting to the people in your community and getting active outside. Women, Get out your doors, connect with the neighbor, start walking regularly, commit it to yourself for your health. Then get your children involved. Oh, they're gonna come. You're gonna be having some fun and they're gonna wanna know why you're not stressing over something they did. I mean, we have stress protests. We're not gonna deal with stress. We've learned to manage that by freeing ourselves of all that pressure. It helps us mentally 
to feel better about ourselves and we find where we can, can contribute in our communities. And, and that was my contribution. I'm going to absolutely second the, the need to have community be a major part of, of healing and of, um, you know, no one succeeds because of individual effort. Nobody fails because of individual failure. I mean, this is all, I think that everyone at the conference has been, has been uh, echoing that point. Um, but as a, as a policy person and a lawyer, I want to say I also think that part of this is, does come down to how do we support people seeing themselves as part of community. And to me, part of that is Medicaid and other state structures we have that can help support those community-grown um, efforts to address local mental health and substance abuse issues. Um, but we have a, a system, a Medicaid system, that allows a lot of flexibility to, um, to reimburse a lot of these activities in a way that's effective and that currently doesn't. Um, I think part of it's the, the lack of having all the funding under one roof. We have all these sort of competing um, uh, streams of funding that make the system complicated for a user, you know, for a consumer, for a person who wants to find out, how do I get these, um, these services if, they're, you know, if their child has a developmental disability, for example, accessing mental health or a substance use disorder. Services should not be complicated. Under Medicaid, it's supposed to be something that you can access. So I think that you know, we, we have um, an op some opportunities now, um, specific ones through 1115 waiver that, um, that Medicaid now has uh, having to do with the um, residential treatment benefit that, that I think that we can use to do some of that blending, that we can use to, to better fund more kinds of practitioners to provide the kind of services that communities need. But I don't, I don't think we need to, I, I, I worry a little bit about having a system that's so individualized by community that it's not replicable, that it's not really universally available. And I, that's why I, I think the Medicaid system is a great place to start and look closely at. Um, one, one of the hard things about behavioral health is that people are behind closed doors, but one place where you can find people with behavioral health is in jail and prison. And I think the, one of the big new generation policies is making meaningful jail and prison reform in two different ways. One of those is um, just cutting the size of the carceral state. So places like Portugal that have decriminalized drugs and even Ohio now has a bill to substantially decrease penalties and, and keep people outside of the system um, when they're caught with drugs. I, I think that's really important because it gives people, like drug court's great, but why does it have to be court? Um, why can't we offer those supports to people before they are in the system and already have a, something on their record? And the second part of that is offering meaningful behavioral health and substance use treatment in jails. Places that have done that, uh, Rhode Island offers any type of treatment, so methadone, uh, suboxone, and I'm talking about opioids solely, suboxone and Vivitrol for people. Um, their choice in conjunction with their physician, their psychiatrist, or their um, counselor, and since they've implemented that, they've not only decreased overdoses amongst people leaving jail, their entire state overdose rate has decreased because so many people leave jail and overdose. And that's not a fair penalty for someone to experience jail and leave and not be able to find a job and then overdose. Uh, and there's something that we can do about that. Yep. For me, it's just enforcement of already existing state and federal parity laws. Um, making sure that people who have substance use or mental health disorders aren't um, denied coverage because of unfair utilization management practices, um, making sure that we have adequate networks of providers both for specialty care and otherwise, um, paying providers enough to make sure that we do have adequate networks of care. Um, so those are mine. Okay, um, I will stay quick, but um, I also had in my notes just to really lift up um, defending the progress I think that we've made so far, and I know we are so far from perfect, but I think that um, Alan yesterday, um, you know, he really highlighted the, that Colorado has expanded Medicaid, um, and defending that expansion and um, making sure that we continue to at least have that like baseline level of coverage and access for folks um, in Medicaid and um, and thinking about how do we better, um, you know, wrap services around if someone is in jail, do they, you know, um, 
thinking about how do we make sure that they stay covered as soon as they get out, that they're able to access treatment as soon as they get out. Um, uh, yeah, and then just a really um, small, like a smallish thing that's happening right now is around the Accountable Care Collaborative, um, one of the waivers that the Medicaid program's operating under and allowing kids, um, or actually allowing everybody to, to get six um, behavioral health visits outside of sort of the capitated rate before they have to go to the designated behavioral health center with a covered diagnosis. Um, and so it's far from fully integrated streams, but it does allow kids then to get those initial sort of behavioral health touches where they get their primary care and to get, um, and it allows you know, adults for that too, if someone just needs some brief counseling for grief or other issues that maybe doesn't create a covered diagnosis, but um, Medicaid's implementing that now, that started July 1, and so I think we all just need to be paying attention to that and making sure that it's being used as much as possible to get folks um, the help that they need. In Alamosa earlier this year, we started um, a lead program that's called the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. And here, this is an opportunity for law enforcement, for somebody who's just busted for having drugs, no violent crimes or anything like that, to take them um, to a place, and I'm not sure exactly where that is, I don't know if it's the Center for Restorative Programs, but where they get screened and see if they're eligible and interested in becoming involved in the program and getting some services that they need. And to me, that's a really great alternative than sending somebody to jail just for having drugs on them. And um, our jails are overpopulated terribly. And this is a nice alternative and to give the person an opportunity to, to come clean with maybe some medicated assisted treatment and the other behavioral health services that they may need so that they can move on with their life and become productive again in our society. <coughs> and Tyrone, will give you the last word. An elder in the community once said, the body is not designed to be sick. And the reason why sometimes we face obstacles in this area is because of the violations that we have committed against ourselves and against the environment. And as I think about that, the violation is the culture that we live in. And we talk about policies and practices, but the culture is sick. So if the culture is sick, it begins to perpetuate the sickness in all systems. So if you look at the human body, we have a digestive system, we have a reproductive system, a muscular system. We have all these systems that must work harmoniously for the whole to function at its highest level. In the moment one of those systems are compromised, it affects the whole. And as I look at this, when we work in silos, many of you have already said it, it, it begins to affect the person. But one thing that we're not addressing in the best practice is the culture. The culture is go to work go to sleep, or go to school, go to work, go to sleep, go to school, go to work. And that in itself creates mental challenges because you don't have time with your family. You don't have time to yourself. You don't have time to be alive. When I was with Yo Yo Ma last night, one thing that he said is, when they asked him, how often did you play the cello? He said, I played efficiently, but my father made sure that I played outside and I had a life. And the culture that we have is not providing us an opportunity to live and enjoy the moment and people. And I think best practices are organizations that see the importance of time, that give their employees time off, that have a moment to relax, to have a time to celebrate and have a time to just be human. And we continuously dehumanize people with the way that we have designed the culture for people to live in. And then we say, why is everyone depressed? Why does everybody have mental problems? because we have not done a good job creating a culture for us all to live in. And I think those who are doing that, those are the best practices and being more harmonious with the, the nature that we live in. So that's what I think. Thank you all again. And as these folks exit, don't rush the stage.
Okay, ladies, how about tell us who you are and your organization and then you can uh, give us some advice. Great, did you, did you go ahead and start? It's on. Hello. <laughs> so my name is Deidre Johnson. I am the CEO and Executive Director for the Center for African American Health. I think, don't start yet. We're just gonna introduce oh. ourselves first. Uh, good morning, I'm Amy Cox. I'm the CEO of Community Health Partnership in Colorado Springs. Hi, my name is Elaine Belansky. I'm the Director of the Center for Rural School Health and Education at the University of Denver. I'm Susan Motika from Boulder County Public Health. I'm Elizabeth Arnalis with the Colorado Center on Law and Policy. I'm Priscilla Montoya Vitello from the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. And I'm Janina Fariñas with La Cocina, a program of the Family Center in Fort Collins, Colorado. Okay. So now, Deidre, did you want to start? Okay. <laughs> um, so some of them are just kind of mundane things. Um, Continuing to support and spread what we know works. Continuing to invest in new and innovative ideas. Um, one of the things I've always had a deep appreciation for with regard to philanthropy's opportunity is the ability behind the scenes to get all the players at the table and to really have those tough discussions. Because collaboration works, but it's messy, it takes time. And there's a certain magic to when you get folks at the table putting their organizational issues aside and thinking about the, the end user, the beneficiary, what's most important to them. And I think my, my aspirational one is, um, I'm currently on this personal professional journey about community voice and how important it is, whether it's you know trying to connect with that young mother with three jobs in need of childcare, or that senior who's isolated, how can we not only meet their needs, but let them understand that they too have a voice that is equally important? And I'm, I'm struck by, you know, these conferences are wonderful, they get larger. There's so much power in this room. And, you know, oftentimes people talk about it's time to speak truth to power. But if everybody who's in this room that has their own sphere of power, uses that and power starts speaking truth, imagine that. And I love the work that you're doing and I, I see the Carl Health Foundation as one of those foundations that not only talks about health equity but pursues it. And so to keep continuing speaking truth but enable others of us in our spheres to collaborate together and have power speak truth so it's not always people coming to chip away at the mountain. I'll go next. I would say to the foundation, keep doing what you're doing. Keep listening, keep broadening the tables, the participation and the leadership of the community broadly in Colorado, and the candor of saying not everybody agrees, and I'm gonna own that, I'm gonna be honest about it, and that's fine. We live in a purple state, not everybody agrees, but to take more courageous positions, to be inclusive, um, and then to be honest about what those challenges and difficulties are. I would say keep doing what you're doing. On the issue of behavioral health, mental health, um, I was kind of up here for the last section because I was thinking where does it fall? But I would say we need a system approach that is really looking at our broader community. The city of Longmont, for example, or a county approach. How do we bind together people and we do a good job of looking at best practices, evidence base. We know what some of the programs are, but what are the communities in America that have really, as other speakers have said, linked community, linked family, linked schools, the key stakeholders with a primary prevention approach and an intervention approach. Um, we can certainly look at the policy levers of the bifurcated or trifurcated system. Absolutely, that's important. But there's a lot of policy work we need to do. And looking at it in a systemic, community-based way, we need the community voice and power. We need um, this systemic approach, which prioritizes prevention as much as the excellent intervention approaches we've heard here today. And I want to jump in right there, if I could. Um, 
So, you know, much of our mental wellness, our mental health, really doesn't depend on experts. It depends on the everyday, and it's our access to um, exercise and creativity and food and community. Um, and I come from a parks and recreation background initially, so I always sort of fall back to that. But um, I was recently traveling in Ireland, and Ireland has a big mental health program um, nationwide right now. They also have a creative program nationwide. But I was really struck by the fact that everywhere I went, um, every tourist destination, you know, every, everywhere I went, there was a message of mental wellness with, at that site. And so, I, you know, as I think about that, and I think about the assets that we have in Colorado, uh, and I think about the influence, more so even than the money, of the Health Foundation, I think about the influence. How do we use your influence to um, affect organizations like Great Outdoors Colorado, who's done this generation wild about getting kids outdoors, but how are we getting more people outdoors? How are we getting more of our, um, more of our adult residents outside? How do we work with our tourism board? How do we make mental wellness just a casual part of our culture? Um, as opposed to something that's separate. And so I think that, you know, with your positions um, and, and your influence, we could take that to a statewide level. So I, I want to pull up and sort of build on a lot of what I've been hearing. I mean, first, uh, let me say that taking this conversation, I'm not sure what the next step is that the foundation has in mind to move forward um, with an action plan um, based on this conference and what you're hearing, I'm sure there's some next step. So I'll, I'll, I'm sure we'll all be looking forward to hearing about that. Um, but I'm gonna pull up some and, and talk about policy as well. So mental health fits uh, in as part of the healthcare system. It has to. That's what we've been striving for. We want it to be integrated um, as part of a systems approach to health. And when I think about sort of the policy environment, we've got to, uh, as Aaron said, keep our eye on the ball. Um, in terms of coverage. Coverage really matters with respect to mental health, and we don't have full coverage. Um, we've got, uh, we've made big strides in Colorado, but we're seeing um, policies, for example, even at the federal level, short-term health plans and others coming that are gonna make um, substantial differences um, with respect to people's access to health care and mental health uh, care, um, depending on how we approach this in Colorado. In Colorado. What, what steps do we take to make sure that we have access to behavioral health going forward? Um, secondly, it, as Bethany said, the Medicaid program is, a, is an incredible vehicle, um, but it, and it's not broad enough to cover everybody. Um, and we have a whole population that's outside of the health insurance system, by and large, um, in terms of our undocumented folks and people who are scared to participate um, for the various reasons that we've heard. It seems to me that the foundation could really lead the charge in Colorado on changing hearts and minds around in inclusion of populations that have traditionally and historically been left out for a range of reasons, including a growing hostility to those communities. Um, the other community where there's a growing hostility, uh, I think, is the poor. Uh, we've seen, I think, our national dialogue um, has sort of shifted uh, to um, trying to make public programs um, uh, different in nature and kind, um, and we're we're really struggling, I think, uh, with the ethics and the um, the baseline uh, investment in public programs in our country. And I think in Colorado that we could be a beacon for um, continuing to support the infrastructure that public programs provide to make sure that families can achieve economic security and lead productive lives in the way that, that that's meaningful to them. So those are all things I think the foundation can really play an enormous role in. Um, and then the last thing was on communications. Uh, I, I agree the foundation could play a huge role. Um, with I know you've hired a communications director um, and that the, the message frame about mental wellness is one the foundation could really take on, um, as well as the message frame around community. Um, those of us working on fiscal policy, for example, in the state have spent years and years thinking about how to change the frame so that we're thinking about uh, what our obligations are to each other rather than just our obligations to ourselves. Um, and I think those things sort of fit together in a way that would be really um, 
enormously helpful if the foundation could think about taking that on. It's a huge lift. I'm very ambitious for the foundation, but um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's absolutely the direction we need to think about moving in. So thank you. Hi, Karen. Donald Valdez here from uh, State Representative for House District 62 in Southern Colorado, and I want to thank the Colorado Health Foundation for putting on this um, symposium for the education, the communication, moving forward, for involving our youth and all of you, um, because we're going to move this back to our communities, to communities in rural Colorado and throughout the state, but also bringing ideas back to the capital to move forward. And I'm more than willing to, to address those because we have so many issues on hand in our communities. And we don't need to be, we need to move forward and educate those in need now more than ever so that next generation continues to, to lead us. And I see so many here and listening here, the ambition to, to help and I want to thank the Colorado Health Foundation for all that they do. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. So I want to maybe talk a little bit about the idea that of how the Colorado Health Foundation could create uh, funding models that directly, uh, hi directly highlight and directly mirror, I would say, the types of things that we're talking about today. For example, we're talking a lot about integration and siloing. Those two words keep coming up over and over and over again. So the idea of integrated funding streams is also something that I think would be very useful. I run a program that's primarily focused on Latinx mental health, Latinx behavioral health. And in our program, we don't think of siloing out a particular family's experience. We're a three-generation program, our families are not siloed, their experiences are not siloed in any way. And so when I have to write a grant that only speaks to a wedge within the program, it makes it very, very challenging for us to take a part of that out, write a grant specifically for that, and then leave a significant segment of our programming out. For us, it would be really important, actually, especially because we are three generations and we are serving undocumented immigrants, which is a population that is completely left out. They have no way to access Medicaid. This is something else that's come up several times. Um, we even serve detainees in the, de in the detention center in Aurora, Colorado. So for us, when we start to slice out little pieces, the funding becomes really only mirroring a power dynamic in the community that doesn't reflect the type of work that we're trying to do. So for us, opportunity to be able to bring together and to present together the type of work that we're doing and say, this is how it all connects, this is how it all is integrated, and this is how it all works together. Can you provide some funding that also does that would be really important. I also want to thank you for such a wonderful symposium. And I wasn't planning on saying this, but one recommendation I have is that I hope that you and your staff have restoration after this so that you have the strength to keep on doing what you're doing. I have a spa appointment this afternoon. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I would love to see the Colorado Health Foundation take on the issue of poverty. Because when we look at the strongest predictors of the quality of our lives, poverty is probably one of the most highly correlated predictors of that. And I feel like that would be getting at the root, root, root causes of why we're even having the conversations about an opioid epidemic, for example. So we spend a lot of time talking to people in the San Luis Valley, and one of the things that we hear is this pervasive sense of hopelessness. And when we dig a little bit deeper to find out where that hopelessness is coming from, oftentimes it's because people don't perceive they have economic opportunity. And I really feel like if we could take on that bold issue and try to figure out economic opportunity, a lot of, a lot of these problems that happen downstream um, will lighten up. And I was thinking about how if we could have conversations of hope with communities around Colorado about what hope looks like for them, and then see how they're defining it and then figure out how they want to approach creating hope in their communities. 
Hello, good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm Gwendolyn West with the Equitas Project, and I wanted to take the opportunity to thank the Health Foundation for uh, the tremendous work you've done to lean into inequities um, that have historically existed and that we're um, still seeing today. So what we do is we disentangle mental health and criminal justice, and um, one big contributor to the mass incarceration issue that we have in this country is poverty, and that's come up a few times. Uh, mental health disorders are also criminalized in this country, and I think that as a continuation of the tremendous work that um, you all have already done toward um, reducing inequities, recognizing that those who are currently caught up in the criminal justice system or who are returning from incarceration, uh, that those individuals fall into these same buckets that we're talking about, we've been talking about the last couple of days. So thank you again for um, everything you're doing and I hope that uh, there can continue to be uh, more light shed on the effects of mass incarceration and um, behavioral health. So I was going to walk off the stage after this wonderful lady eloquently put what she said together. That was beautiful. And thank you for saying what you said, because that's exactly what I was thinking. And then I was wondering, what else can I say and add to that? And one thing that we did a couple of years ago, so some people ask me my name and say, hey, I never caught your name. My name is Tyrone Beverly, and I'm the founder of an organization by the name of I'm Unique. And the mission of I'm Unique is to create a culture of health, individual growth, and social change. And in the study that we conducted three years ago, um, we, we had a lot of conversations around access. People were saying, there's a lot of people who don't have access to clean food, to, to, to vegetables. And I said, let's put that to the test. So what we did, we hosted an event and we had food that would be considered nutritious and good, and then we had food that was not. And then we said, let's see what goes first to these people who they say don't have access to it. And then what we found out is the food that was unhealthy is what everyone wanted but they had access to what may be beneficial for them. They had the access, but they chose something that was not good for them. And then we looked at culture again, and we said, well, what do you eat when you go to the movies? And most people say, I eat popcorn and nachos. I said, okay. What do you eat when you go to a baseball game? Who taught you how to do that? The culture. So culture influences behavior. And if we go to the foundation and we talk about, well, we're, we're working on shifting culture and changing the narrative, that may not work in the grant. That may not work in our proposal. And we say, what's your long-term outcomes? Well, we're, we're working on building a culture. So we may not fit in some of those opportunities because we're not addressing it in the same lens that you may be uh, wanting to see it in, but culture is what influences us all every single day. When you're in traffic, your response, you've been conditioned to respond in an angry way because no one ever told you that you can respond in a different way, but like he said, we don't have the information to say, okay, there's a different way to be alive and live in this world, but our culture is making us sick. And one thing in our teaching we have, it goes like this. When we talk about some of the main causes of disease that we can prevent because some things in life happen and they're out of our control. But then when we talk about self-care, there's three things that we all do. And number one is this, crimes against wisdom. And some people say, what does that mean? The first time you drink alcohol, you may spit it out because your body rejects it. But then you continue to consume it and you commit a crime against yourself. And you commit a crime against wisdom. Next one, the abuse of the senses. We indulge in all of these food because of its sensation, the visual, and what we taste and we abuse our senses. And lastly, the effects of time on all of that has a long-lasting impact on our lives. So those are the things that we can apply to our lives to prevent, but if we put that in the application and we give the information, that may not work. And I think those are some things that we should consider is being more innovative with how we look at addressing community issues because the way we work and the way we are changing lives may not fit the lens and the narrative in which you want to see it in. Thank you. Yeah. I, I was going to say something really similar, and um, I'm not nearly as eloquent or as well formed. Um, I think something is wrong. S something is wrong, and we need to spend some time agreeing that we are not okay. Uh, individually, we are not okay. As a society, we are not okay. 
and we're not having this conversation. Inequity is an outcome of a society that is sick. Mental health issues are an outcome of a society that is sick. We, we don't spend the time creating connections and relationships with people around us. We don't know ourselves. We don't know others. And so there's this thing that just keeps perpetuating. There's a divide between uh, what, we, what we want for ourselves, what we have been told we want, um, and, and our natural way of being. And uh, there's an author by the name of Ken Wilber who writes about the evolution of, of humanity. And we are living in a time in which uh, cognitive science has shown we have developed a, a frontal lobe. We are aware that we are. We exist. We also are aware that there is something greater than ourselves that exists. We feel it from time to time. If we really tap in, in those moments that Tyrone was helping us with in silence, we can feel that there is something greater than ourselves. We also know that we are not that. So we exist, we know that there's something greater than ourselves, and we know that we are not that. That's a divide that we need to be able to navigate. We need to have conversations about navigating that together. And I think it all starts with more connection and being aware of the fact that we are not okay and having that conversation more regularly. So it's not about access. It's about um, <coughs> deconstructing ways of knowing, right? And then constructing ways of knowing that are healthy and productive uh, and human-centered. So we are, I'm, I'm going to let you speak. We are horribly over time, and in, and in um, respect for our other speakers, I'm going to let the last three people make very quick comments. If you have longer comments, we will stay afterwards and, and take your feedback still. I'm Patrick Ortiz. I work with a nonprofit based in the San Luis Valley called San Luis Valley Great Outdoors, and we promote outdoor recreation and um, health and wellness associated with that. Um, I look at the Colorado Health Foundation, one of their pillars, one of their goals is encouraging policy advocacy. And I think that really starts with the youth and be, be creating an informed constituency with the youth as far as civic engagement, learning about the issues that affect them and getting involved in the political process, learning about the candidates, learning about the issues at hand, locally, state, federally, and getting the vote out. We need more people voting. We need more people engaged in the political process. And that's where really real chains can come from. You know, our, our, our country was built upon being a democratic republic. And I think we got to get back to our roots, um, to those founding fathers and what their goals were, and getting back to creating a real democracy um, for future generations to be informed and really become empowered to make that change for themselves and their communities. Yes. Um, so I mentioned before that I work for the state. I'm the director of the Division of Housing um, in DOLA. And I did want to mention all the great things that are happening and then build on the comments uh, that other folks made. So at the Division of Housing, uh, obviously we're statewide. We have partnerships with Department of Corrections, with the Office of Behavioral Health and we're providing vouchers uh, in partnerships with communities um, to house people coming uh, from corrections, from jails, from our mental health, uh, our mental uh, institutions. Um, and so what I wanted to mention was recently someone asked me, um, where are you seeing the greatest need? Is it with behavioral health, mental health issues? Is it with substance use issues? And honestly, I took a, a seat back. I mean, you hear who we're working with statewide. And I thought, huh, such a good question that seems like it should be on the tip of my tongue. And it wasn't. So I went back to my office where we have the Office of Homeless Initiatives, um, where we're working daily with folks um, to get them into housing, stabilized lives. And I asked the question, and again, the director of our Office of Homeless Initiative did the same thing I did. Such a good question. And it really is dual diagnosis. Of course, there are people on both sides, but it's the dual diagnosis and having that integrated care um, so that we can serve the whole person is really, if you can have an impact, in growing those efforts and being more effective because the answer is not one thing, it's the whole person and that includes um, serving 
all aspects of that. So, thank you. My name is Jamie Dominguez. Um, I just first of all want to thank you. I thought I would never ever be here. I am a community activist. I come from the San Luis Valley. I come from Amara's community. And the one thing I want to say is that don't be scared to invest into new, new things because I never ever thought I would be here. Mm -hmm. I sat down there and I wasn't going to come up for the first two questions or this one, but I need to because there is power in that. <laughs> I, I never thought I would be sitting here and have the time or the place to say on behalf of my community, on behalf of Amara, on behalf of everybody that lives them kind of lives that what you are doing is helping. I came here as an upstream member and I'm helping my team and I hope we get what we need to move forward in our community. I come from the same place Donald comes from. This is just the awesomest thing ever. Come, I'm, I'm a recovering alcoholic, recovering gang member. Um, community member, and apparently now I'm somewhat a professional going to bat for my community with the help of you. Thank you. Last comment. I just want to say that I think the role of the Colorado Health Foundation is to continue to be bold and courageous and to invest in organizations um, that are often overlooked and don't have the access um, for other um, huge funding sources. So thank you for being bold. Thank you all. Thank you to everyone that participated. The other two, thank you for all the, your attention. We don't have a break scheduled this morning, so take a minute and stretch while we reconfigure the stage, and then Erica Snow is going to come up and get us going for the rest of the morning. Thanks all. <laughs>